I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. God save the king. Love podcasts. Hate nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Politics Show podcast. Woo! Uh, I'm joined, as always, by the golden boy of Politics Joe, Ed Campbell, our producer. Hello, Ed. Hello. How are you? Let's have a little cheers as well there. Cheers. God save the king. God save the king. <laughs> and Ben Smoke, uh, political editor of Huck Magazine and longtime friend of Politics Joe. How, How are you, mate? I'm all right, thank you. Um, full of cheer. Full of cheer. Good. Full of cheer. Full of regal mm. coronation cheer. Full yeah. From my queen, coronation. Diana. <laughs> Uh, how did how did we feel watching? Did you watch it first of all? I guess is the question over the weekend. I watched little bits of it, and I'd say my main takeaway was that it was a difficult wank. Um, <laughs> but I really persevered. Um, you got it done. You got it done. By the end, I was as upright as Penny Mordaunt's sword. V- um, view- viewers might be concerned that. The podcast would be a bit different without Ava here and Ben here, but it's not. It's, <laughs> it's exactly the same. It's I've exactly actually spoken to her and she said the exact same thing about it. <laughs> it's a, no, almost uh, we could have planned this better for our second episode that she wouldn't be on holiday. Um, but could know, have. We could have done, but that would be boring and, and too well organised for us. But we're, we're, we're all the richer and better for having you here, Ben. So thank Thanks you very for much me. for joining us. Um, the biggest sort of takeaway, I guess if we were to talk about the, sort of the news angle over the weekend, is these arrests, other, other than the coronation of a new head of state, that's quite a big, quite a big news thing. Um, but these arrests, right, the, and there's been quite a few of them, people from uh, the protest group Republic, which the clue is in the name, opposed the monarchy, uh, their organiser, and a few others, they were nicked preemptively, in fact. He was arrested at his house, uh, Just Stop Oil. There were some people who were just wearing Just Stop Oil t-shirts. They didn't actually have any of the gear for like locking on or anything like that. They also got arrested. And then this bizarre instance of the sort of nighttime wardens in Soho mm-hmm. getting arrested the night before and held in custody, I think, for about 16 hours um, because they were in possession of rape alarms. Mm. Which obviously, if you're a night warden, is a sort of fundamental thing. Yeah. Mm. So. I mean, it's understandable why the Met Police might be so against rape alarms, particularly, <laughs> <laughs> yes. particularly police officers from the Charing Cross police station. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, like, what's quite interesting about this, and I think what's been quite funny watching it play out over the weekend, is lots of people who've been like, protest is now dead. Protest is over. The right to protest is over. And it's it's been a little bit like, welcome. <laughs> if we're Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Lovely to have you with us. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, I don't think the rights process is dead. I, don't, I think it's a really deeply like unhelpful framing of it. Like the reality is, is that the police. Uh, you know, I saw one tweet that was like, yeah, the, the police. This isn't British policing. This isn't Britain. Mm. And I'm like, sir, <laughs> <laughs> sir. It really is. Literally, sir. and it's like the police are cutting about on the streets of London as they have been doing for the last forty years. Mm. Um, if you go back to like the '80s and the police tactics that we see now, they were created in conjunction between Willie Whitelaw, who was Thatcher's um, Home Secretary, and the Police Federation at the time, and they created a lot of the tactics that we see and they used them and tested them out on picket lines and so the kind of like the aggressive um like preemptive strikes that we see and we've seen it through like decades generations of activists so did it come as like a huge shock no should people who were organizing have known better Yes. Like, does that in any way, is that in any way to blame them for what happened? No. But like this idea that we can, that we're all fine if we chat to the police and it's all going to be okay. It's like, no, that's just not how these things work. I think there's a, um, there's a real point of difference here as well between, let's say something like, I don't know, Ben, breaking onto the runway at Stansted Airport <laughs> and chaining yourself to an airplane to stop mm. a deportation flight uh, mm. taking place, which, you know... What some... specific example? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But whoever did that was clearly a handsome legend. Yeah, a, 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 a handsome legend called Ben Smoke. Um, but, th- you know, that's that's one thing. And on, and on the other side of it, there's walking towards the coronation and mm. being preempted. Like, there, there is a, there is, there's a pretty big difference there between you being arrested before you've actually... Well, done it. Not even direct action. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, I think they had a they had a protest area right siphoned off for them at the coronation. So presumably he was just going to head there and hold a placard. But... Right, and not my king at the car. It was like the least of all the, with all the protests that have been in the limelight in the past couple of years. 
that's like the most milk toast, yeah. basic, boring protest. Mm. Like the people, like the trust of all people to be like, is that it? Like, come on, guys. <laughs> you guys fucking suck. You're not gluing yourselves to anything. <laughs> this is... up, Will, we're literally just planning to go and hold up placards because like the reality of it is, is that people in activist groups, people organizing understand the way that the Met were going to react mm. and understood the way that they would utilize this kind of like outpouring of like flag shagging sycophancy to like play out their wildest dreams of repression and so they knew that which is why they weren't you know planning to do anything as far as i know like absolutely fucking batshit as much as that would be fun mm. and it would have been camp <laughs> <laughs> and even doing that camp anyway <laughs> <laughs> like even doing that it was like too much for the met and i think what's quite interesting is what, like, a lot of the framing around it has been like well the met decided that this is where the line is the met decided that the risks that way and it's just like hold on a second but like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. what why why are these people, these people who have been like over and over again proven to not be fit to hold the power that they have and continually adding more power to it? Why is it that these people are getting to decide what is a fundamental human right, a human right that is entrenched within domestic and international law under the European Convention of Human Rights and the Human Rights Act? Why are they getting to decide? I mean, like, even look back, like, it's literally been a month and, like, five days or whatever it is since the case review. Mm. Look at Mark Rowley, commissioner of the Met's response to it. You know, he was talking about how integrity is central to policing and we've clearly failed. You know, we clearly are, to paraphrase, fucking nut jobs. <laughs> Who have like who have no business that's being all, anywhere near a baton? That's almost a direct quote as well. Mm. It's not, <laughs> yeah. that's not actually a paraphrasing, really. Um, yeah, it's it's so true, isn't it? Ed? This you know you look at uh, the, you know the report into Stephen Lawrence's murder, right? It finds that the Met is institutionally racist. The report into the Daniel Morgan murder finds that the Met is institutionally corrupt. Fast forward a few decades further on, the Casey report finds yes that all of those things are true, and still nothing has been done about it. And people, I think, also should they should they shouldn't have any illusions about whose interests the Met Police serves, mm. right? If if you want to take like an abstract argument about policing in this country, right? The uh, common law descends from its property law, right? So the people that exist to enforce the law are going to uphold people who have property. They're going to maintain the rights of people who have property. Also, the police. They swear an oath of allegiance to the to the crown. Yep. It's, it's, it's like the arm... They have crowns on their fucking hats. <laughs> it's, it's, it really should be obvious <laughs> by now. They're not going to take you fucking around at the coronation very well. What I, th what I think's interesting is the whole thing seems to have been framed as we didn't want them to spoil it. Because <laughs> yeah. when I was, I was at the mile, spent two and a half days there last week. Godspeed, mate. That's fucking it. How are you feeling? <laughs> Loved it. Uh, How's that <laughs> pint of men's mental health going down for you? <laughs> um, but I, I asked the people camping on the mile, like, how do you feel about the protest? And to be fair to a few of them, a few of them did say, it's their right, we live in a free country. I disagree with them, but they can do what they want. Other people were like, they're not, they can't do it on Saturday. Why Saturday? <laughs> it being the coronation, that's maybe the most, if you're an anti-monarchist organization, that's maybe the one day in the past 70 years that you are going to mount, try and mount an anti-monarchist protest. But it's the, the whole thing I think was about perception and how it seemed to the outside world. If you watch the BBC's coverage, um, on Saturday, I think you would be under the impression that the entire country was out celebrating, out mm. waving flags. There was no mention of the protest, as far as I'm aware. There was no mention of any anti-monarchist sentiment, which I kind of think, I was thinking about, like, is there an example? And it's if you watched the inauguration of Donald Trump and no one mentioned that there was a large opposition to it. Mm. It's, it's, it was, the whole thing was incredibly dishonest. Like, I was walking through central London on Saturday in London Bridge and I saw two union flags hanging on balconies and that was it. You wouldn't mm. have known there was a coronation. Like I watched it on my, I watched the coronation on my, on my laptop in my kitchen. Like, I, yeah. Because I, I feel professionally obliged to. It's not like... <laughs> <Nerd>. <laughs> I want to make it clear to listeners that Ed was not professionally obliged to, li to, li to, li to listen to that. Um, I want to make it clear to my editor that I did and I was very dil diligent. <laughs> diligent. Very diligent. You were, sorry, I watched it with Ben. Ben was also there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I actually think the media is a little bit behind the monarchy on this in in the sort of deferential way that we that we talk about this. Even even in the context of the protests, right? That but we don't have to talk about it like that. We can just talk about the BBC's rolling coverage of the actual event. But you know, the the the, the <laughs> Mail wrote up um, the sort of the plans of protesters to disrupt uh, to disrupt the coronation, which was 
if you go through it line by line, completely baseless. Um, the, the, only, <laughs> the, only, the, only, the only people that had actually said they were considering bringing rape alarms to the coronation was like a hard right English constitutional political party. It wasn't eco. <laughs> it wasn't eco protesters. As the quite male. Sick. fucking day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just that, fucking chill out, lads. Your party. They, it's all for you. Because they disagree with like the the Jacobite rebellion or the Stuarts <laughs> inheriting the crown. It's actually like a centuries long schism that they've taken. <laughs> but no, completely. I think I think in many ways the media is almost in sort of a 1950s type m- mindset of being deferential to royalty and being deferential to um, the king. I mean, I kind of. I get it and I don't because I'll, I'll be honest I had this I had a strange sense during the coronation I found it deeply weird and the way it sort of obvious is such an obvious representation of kind of hierarchy class structure and the nonsense of sort of hereditary supremacy but on the other hand I was watching it and I'm watching King Charles you know that wooden chair he sat in mm-hmm. he's like 700 years old mm. you know, that's fucking cool that, that, <laughs> that is cool and like oh, if, if you, you went know, to a restaurant and they were like here's a chair it's 700 years old half of it's missing it's got graffiti all over it and there's a fucking big rock in the bottom it'd be like <laughs> No, I'm not paying for this, mate. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's weird. Ed, Ed, just a word, Ed, on what is it? The, the ceremonial stone, the stone Ed, of truth, the stone of destiny, the stone of destiny, the yeah. stone of scone. It's the it's what um, the kings of Scotland were crowned on, and I actually find the whole debate about the stone of destiny the most cringe <laughs> what, thing. What is the debate for someone who's not familiar? Because oh, it's like because it's a symbol of Scotland. And England stole it in like maybe the 12th or 13th century. And then I think a group of students stole it back at one point in like the 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 50s maybe. But like Alex Salmon said, he would have had a ring of policemen stopping the Stone of (laughs) of Destiny being taken for the coronation. Like Iron Curtain. It's like a whole like, it's one of the most cringe aspects of Scottish nationalism. Like surely if you object to the British monarchy, you also object to the Scottish monarchy. Mm. Which like... Just because you like Robert the Bruce doesn't mean he was still a king. He still probably just had some like quite regressive tax policies in his time. Like I don't know, he probably, he probably wasn't was not peasants. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. It's it's just the whole the whole kind of discourse about the son of destiny, which is ultimately quite cringe. Which is I suppose if you can if you consent to Scotland being a part of the United Kingdom, which I suppose you have to if you're the government, even if you're a Scottish nationalist party, you have to consent to that. So you have to participate in the state instruments and the state engines Hamza Yusuf was there mm. so it's not like I, said, I object do you, like, do you object more to Hamza Yusuf being there no I object to the stone being there like, <laughs> what are you talking about uh, Ben the, 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 the sort of justification for some of these arrests right, was the concern about locking on mm. and I think it's uh, telling that the police have found no equipment necessary to actually lock onto anything they found like a megaphone and a placard they were able to conduct these arrests because of uh, legislation related to the Public Order Act pushed through on the Friday mm. um, by Suella Braverman in the Home Office. Your your thoughts and feelings about that piece of legislation and what it says about the country that we live in at the moment? I mean, it's just like, it's so small time, isn't it? <laughs> like, all of these pieces, it's just quite funny because obviously it's not funny in any way. Like, it's deeply disturbing. I know what you mean. Regressive, fascistic, draconian. Um, but it's quite funny that, like, every single time a protest group does something, the government are like, oh, shit. <laughs> Fuck. We didn't, we didn't think of that yeah, one. Oh, damn it. <laughs> and they're like, oh, shit, put a new law in. Go, go, go. And it's just like, firstly, like if you look at the um, policing act, you look at the public order um, bill act, you look at like the, the bill of rights that they're trying to bring through. Like none of the, like, yes, they are quite specific in that, like, yeah, they did give powers to um, to like arrest Republic, for example, because I think it was like one of them had a box cutter so that they could like take the plastic off the placards. And there were some like luggage straps so that the placards weren't like flying about in the back of the van. And the cops were like, well, you could lock on with that. It's like, <laughs> I used <laughs> with the greatest respect, mate. <laughs> you fucking couldn't. Um, and so it's sort of like, yes, they are utilizing it, but the, in reality, they've, they've had these kind of powers. It just speaks to a government that's desperate mm-hmm. and a government that it's like that um, that Mitchell and Webb meme, isn't it? It's like, are we the bad guys? Because it's sort <laughs> of like, I mean, we'll come on to it later with the um, with the barge. Um, you know, like they, they were talking about putting it in a place where they can stop protests. You know, they put in all of these different pieces of legislation to like stop, you know, the public uh, the policing bill for example was brought in and had bits to stop people 
doing airport incursions. I don't know why. Wonder why. <laughs> um, or to like shutting down major bits of highway after insulate Britain or you know any of you know look at you could literally read word for word and be like, okay, well that's XR, that's insulate Britain, that's this. And it's mm. just like this government is so set and is so like thin skinned and it's so <laughs> like, it's just embarrassing. It's just like you're literally the government and you're getting upset <laughs> that a few people are walking a little bit slow down the strand. Yeah. It's yeah. like do you not have bigger things to to worry about like there is a an historic cost of living crisis in this country like poverty levels are obscene three million food parcels up to march of this year that i think i worked out is it's like 10.5 food parcels every single minute of the last year like that's insane in a country that is the fifth wealthiest economy and the government is out there legislating for that and it's just like do they not at any point take a step back and think hold on a second maybe the fact that this keeps happening maybe people feel so committed that they will literally put themselves in prison for like really shit things like sitting in a road like that's no reason to go to jail isn't mm. it but they will do it because they feel this strongly maybe there's something else at play maybe we should look at this and understand why it is that people feel so strongly and start legislating on that, on the major issues that face us today. And the, the coronation is just like a perfect little slice, a perfect little sliver of Britain today. It's small time, it's pathetic. It's, it's looking back at a history that never was to ignore a part of a future. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> a really good fucking line. Yeah. It's looking back at a history that never was to ignore a present that is abominable and a future that's gonna be even worse. Yeah, bang on. So we can expect Keir Starmer to uh, repeal all of this legislation. <laughs> Thank God. He's actually breaking <laughs> bombshell. He, he actually committed to undoing all the legislation and to enshrine a new constitution where you, <laughs> where there's no king. Uh, you can... No House of Lords. No House of Lords. Elect House of Lords. Mm. Um, three pints on the weekend. <laughs> Every day week and a three-day Monday. Guys, this is sick. <laughs> Shock, no, he's a cop. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually saw Nandy this morning saying that they won't repeal. Who are, uh, who's progress. Labour for? I asked this in the last <laughs> podcast, but like, what? What are they doing? As in, who are they? You might think, okay, well, they might not be as... Well, they're in the business of getting a grip on government. Right? <laughs> but, like, the adults are back in the back room. But, like, you might think, you might think, oh, maybe... Well, they're not as, like, great economically as perhaps I would like. But thank God they're so socially liberal. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Who is, who's this for? Mm. Who, like, which of them... Like, even, like, Julia Hartley Brewer was against the Met's behaviour at the weekend. And she's not exactly the most liberal person... Mm. on morning radio mm. so who is that who's I the literally, like, I, field as well <laughs> i literally saw like as, as we were like setting up i saw lawrence fox had tweeted saying that it was disgusting policing when the police like took out those two dogs that's also another thing that i think we need to mention is that yeah. the police have been on a fucking mad one this weekend is that not only did they do all of that they were also just wandering about east london like taking out dogs and tasering homeless people like even lawrence fox was like you know what bit much <laughs> they got shushed up by the coronation they were like yeah these two pit bulls fucking you're going down but like is is Labour just angling for the police vote like there's not like that's not a really big part of the electoral we will coalition hire half a million police officers <laughs> yeah. and they will all vote for us yeah like I don't like is it if that's their tactic, then what they're doing makes sense. Mm. But what other justification can they have for their this is behavior? A good, this is a good way for us to start talking about the local elections, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Fucking yes. Um, Another difficult wank. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, topic, Ed Davey, every topic. Every topic. Ed Davey in the clock. You were like, <laughs> Ed Davey, Ed Davey on a, your hands. He had a throb on. <laughs> He got his cock out, clock out. Diff difficult to get hard for the local elections. Although I suppose the Tories losing a thousand seats, yeah, mm. Mm, yeah, we're getting there. But only five hundred of those gains were by the Labour Party. Um, big showing for the Lib Dems with four hundred. But I mean, I do. You kind of have to write off anything the Lib Dems do in the local elections because they will just tell you whatever you want to hear. Oh, you 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 want you you oppose the construction of the bypass. Well, we'll stop the bypass. Oh, you you want the bypass? Yeah, well, we'll build the bypass. <laughs> don't worry. Well, don't worry. We will build the bypass. Uh, housing, housing. No, 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 no housing. They will literally tell you what. There's no cohesive ideology. They just tell you whatever you want to think. And so at local elections, they do quite well. <laughs> the Greens, however, 
there's a, there's an interesting story there, isn't there, Ben? Because mm. they they had they had a pretty good showing, and particularly in the context, I think Labour five hundred Greens were more than a hundred, weren't they? Getting close to two hundred, I think, or some, something like that. The numbers are irrelevant, but it's a good showing for them. Well, I think the thing is, is that like, and again, your Lib Dems, you're right. Like they are shameless, but the what we can see from Lib Dems and from Green is that like they have a ground game. And they are attuned to local issues. Obviously, you can't trust Lib Dems. That's as another way of putting them. what I just said. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust them as far as you can fucking throw them. Yeah, too. But right. like, they understand what different communities want and need. Whereas Keir Starmer's cutting about being like, "Vote for us for council. Don't worry, we'll sort out the NHS." And it's like, yeah, what? What, 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 what do you think the council does? <laughs> Literally, it's just like, they're there for bins and potholes, mate. Like, uh, they're not going to like the, the local councils going out and like fighting fucking inflation. Like, they, <laughs> they can't do that. They don't have the power to do it. So the People's like... Republic of Medway. Right. <laughs> there is an interesting line here, though, isn't there? Because uh, you, there's there's the political angle. There's the, the ideological, theoretical political angle of purging the left from the Labour Party, right? Mm. The, de- the massive downside of that is that with the big groundswell of membership that Jeremy Corbyn introduced to the Labour Party was this huge wave of volunteers who would go out and knock doors, mm. distribute pe- le- leaflets like canvas for you, etc. And those people have now left the party. Or been kicked out. Well, yes, okay. <laughs> they Aggressively yes. You, Euphemistically, out. they've left the party. <laughs> yeah. Yes, then. That... They've left the party. Is that not true? I they see haven't. you're not reading your show notes. Madelson <laughs> 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 comes yeah. out with a gun yeah. behind me. Uh, <laughs> that dog, Tower uh, Hamlet. Uh. He was there, actually, with a shotgun. You know, you know Mandelson when I went to a Labour conference this year the first person I saw was Peter Mandelson really like, and I was like I hope you That's... tapped him up I was like Peter <laughs> lovely to see you again brother my guy my guy Peter solidarity <laughs> Ben so talk to me a little bit more about how the Greens and the Independents uh, did so I think it's quite interesting is that we've had over the last I mean maybe decade we've had like various different like green swells that have always promised to be this like tidal wave but have never quite crested and part of that can maybe be explained by the rise of Corbynism um, obviously kind of like pre you know in in the sort of like Ed Miliband years Greens were really the only people that were like bashing the drum of anti-austerity so they was a natural home for a lot of people and then when Corbyn sort of rose up people drifted towards there also the Greens kind of as everyone did went a bit batshit during Brexit and were suddenly like let's rejoin and also we should have the euro and also they didn't have to say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> and also let's be Portugal like bra- <laughs> brazenly lying <laughs> Like everyone has to get an EU tattoo on their forehead. <laughs> but no one can do well. That's insane. <laughs> so it's just all, it's just all this sort of like never really quite happened for them. But now we're sort of back in back again in like the 2010 to 2015 era of like a really shite, like one pump and done Labour Party. And people want a little bit more foreplay, they want a little bit more fiddle. So mm. the Greens are there. And I think that that like you know speaks to that. Um, you know, they've they saw huge gains across the country. What was really interesting, I think, is that like Waverley, which is so like I've lived all over the place, but when I was growing up, I spent a bit of time in East Anglia. So Waverley's like Suffolky area, I think. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we looked this. at a map. Um, <laughs> I lived in a lot of places. It's, they all merge into one, but like it's just like not the kind of place that you would generally think, and that we've been talking about. We've been talking a lot about how the Greens are going to take Bristol West at mm. Bangham's time is. Um, coming to an end, mercifully. But and that, like Carla Denia, who's who's the co-leader of the Green Party, who is a councillor in Bristol, she's going to be the second MP. And now, out of nowhere, suddenly it's the other co-leader, Adrian Ramsey, who has about as much charisma as Keir Starmer. That's so fucking hell. <laughs> is somehow going to be the next? Wow. Is going to be the second Green MP, and that's going to be for Waverley. So that's quite an interesting story. I think another thing to mention is that they collapsed completely in Brighton. Uh, but absolutely trounced it in Lewis. So it's sort of, you know, an overall success. Um, Is that going to... So they also um, have the first green run uh, council in Europe, as far as I'm aware. Mm. This, so they want, they've got complete control. I don't know what council it is. I should have looked that up. <laughs> right. But they, 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 they have, there's now a complete green run council in Britain, and it's the first green run council in oh, well, Europe. Well, as in every single councillor is a green, is that what you're saying? Or as in, like, they have control of it. Overall control. They overall control, control of Brighton. <laughs> Did they not? Am I, I yeah. thinking that? Did up? they? I thought they did, but then also. I, I, well, let's fact check this. I literally, I just. I'm going to Google, ladies I, and gentlemen. I read, I read this. You guys just, talk amongst yourselves. I just vibed that onto Brian. <laughs> <laughs> deplorable things on the beach, and then go home. <laughs> counting, <laughs> counting the green counts, as you see. Like, this is a yeah, green in a different place. way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me and all of them under the pier. <laughs> is that Polanski? <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's see what we get. Um, Caroline Lucas, what are you Caroline, doing here? I think Caroline Lucas said this. Yeah, man, you're not right. You're, yes. you're, sorry, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Mm. Gr- Greens win first ever council outright. Green really? Party wins first ever council majority. Wow. Um, yeah. As the biggest party in Mid Suffolk District Council. Yeah, which must be Waverley. Yeah, right? it's probably uh, Waverley adjacent. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That was, that was a real <laughs> alley oop from Ben and me. Ah, <laughs> it, yeah, it's so interesting. We got, no, fact. we got there collectively. So before their victory in Mid Suffolk, the only other Green run councils, such as Brighton and Hove, was a min- were minority administrations. Uh, so okay. that's the point of difference there. So it's a majority. Yeah. So everyone so, so is what a winner. I said. Every, yeah, you're, you're both right. right. <laughs> you're, you're both right in different mm. ways. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> you both look at me with such disdain. <laughs> like, there's no way you know this fact about the Greens. This fact that you gave no facts to. Like, it's just like a, a vibe It was a vibe. It was, yeah, it was a vibe But I think it's, like, it it's quite interesting, isn't it? That like, this is happening. Will, will this translate to mm. you know, something in the generals? I don't know. Um, what on, on the subject of the generals, though, what is also another kind of like interesting low level story is that several fairly like prominent in terms of their local area left wingers from the Labour Party who were chucked out of the Labour Party then contested as independents. So in Liverpool and in Portsmouth and then won. And that's kind of not really been picked up in the sweeping like analysis of it. I don't think it's sort of, we don't need to look at it in terms of like a wide ranging like um, trend, but should give Keir Starmer pause for thought given Mm. that there are some notable left wingers (laughs) that used to be Labour MPs who are now potentially going to run as independents Mm -hmm. and understanding that the reason that they did that and the way that they did that is because they are part of their communities they are intrinsic within it and and obviously like we're talking about Jeremy Corbyn here you know you cannot walk around Islington North with that man without being stopped by someone who he knows the name of them and their parents and their grandparents and also their aunt that lives somehow in Suffolk and (laughs) has done like stuff for all of them and then there's a kebab shop that's got like his face all over all of the kebabs and all this so it's like that I think is quite an interesting precursor to some of the like battles that we'll see. Well, Ben, I hate to tell you, but um, Keir Starmer says that the people who turned away from us during the Corbyn years and the Brexit years are coming back, <laughs> baby. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> you guys fucking suck. Ah, lucky. Um, and he will also say today when he meets with his shadow cabinet that the NHS trumps woke every day of the week um that's probably why people are coming back i guess with insight insights like that no i i, I was b- being glib but like your 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 nuanced point is is, is important mm. and and accurate but i and i i think we should just be cautious when we're analyzing these local elections to not over overread labor's performance here because mm. i think really the story is one of of, of tory implosion mm. It is it is trustonomics coming back to bite. It is Partygate coming back to bite. It's Chris Pincher. It's bo- the the entire Boris Johnson mm-hmm. colostomy bag of a government coming back to bite in a way you really don't want a colostomy bag to come back. And yeah, that's a defaulty colostomy <laughs> bag. That's, that's not what it's meant to do. <laughs> <Run it over. laughs> um, and and I think it really is their own ineptitude. I guess this 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 is this is the point of difference and the thing that frustrates me about Keir. And I will you know I'll give him his due if you like in terms of political strategy, which is that in Instead of trying to galvanize a movement and instead of trying to put forward ideas, a belief system and bring people into that movement and sort of, you know, galvanize change in the country, he is his strategy is essentially uh, hodl, sit on the lead, make sure I don't fuck it up too much and they're going to implode and I'll be able to I'll be able to get away and coast into government yeah. without having to, you know, do too much, without having to be too, too radical, etc. And we will see if that strategy pays off, but for me, for me personally, I don't really like the triangulation focus group type approach. I think a leader's job is to lead and mm. to come up with ideas that makes people want to, you know, join I, join a party and go move forward with it. I think it's quite impressive that for however long we've all been talking about this, we haven't mentioned coalition. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's all. That's, it's, it's quite funny. It's, it's quite funny when you like <coughs> political journalism is like the local elections were on fr- uh, the results were on Friday, and every single thing is like, well, now uh, all everyone's talking about is the Labour coalition government that's coming. <laughs> Will it be with the Lib Dems or SNP? <laughs> and that's like, mm. and it's like analysis is just pivoted to that. And I think like an important caveat to that is that these local elections excluded a large. Majority, a large part of the country. It was just England, wasn't it? Just England. It? Oh, yeah. it, it, it assumes all of England. It assumes no change in Scotland, which isn't going to happen. Like Labour will win seats in mm. in Scotland. So I think that's like an important caveat to the discussion of like these local elections weren't beat like ten out of ten amazing for Starmer. 
but it could swing the other. It, it, he could do better. But then I guess the flip side of that argument is that the the local elections that just happened four years ago were at the like depths of Theresa May's like floundering, mm. and Keir managed to up the vote percentage by 0.1 percent like yeah yeah you know, and uh, at the, the depths of <clears throat> Theresa May's floundering but also at the depths of like the the very much the beginning of the end for Corbynism and so like the idea that in these four years in three years of Starmer's leadership in like throwing off every single thing that he allegedly believes in in like <laughs> expelling half of the party what he's achieved is 0.1 percent I think that's a vote. pretty good trade. I don't know, I don't know about <laughs> you, Ben. Yeah. This is like if I invested in stocks. Oh, this is what would happen. Why I don't? Because I'm a fucking idiot, and I'd be like, "Wow, well, it's a positive." Yeah, but it's Nailed. a gain. It's a, yeah. we're in the black. Can we eat for a week? No, <laughs> but look what I did. And it's just like that's what Starmer is doing, and he's just wandering around. I think the the idea that like after all came out and we kind of looked at the adjusted percentages, and it's like Labour squeaking in. To a minority, and you're right in that, like, it's not reflective of the entire routine of, like, you know, the people that are going to be voting. But I think it's, like, fairly indicative of the fact that this triangulation, this sort of, like, oh, just hold on. Because Keir Starmer, for the first, like, two years, even now to a certain extent, his whole shtick was, I'm not Boris Johnson, I'm not Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. And it's like, okay, well, that kind of worked for a little bit, particularly yeah. when we were all in. Who like, are you? <laughs> yeah, like, right? It's just like, what do you, what uh -huh. do you stand for beyond? And it's just like, we're not going to repeal anything because that would be a lot of work. <laughs> We're gonna keep like we're gonna keep everything frozen at the rates that it is now when none of you can afford anything. We're gonna chat a little bit about the NHS maybe for a bit. We might wheel Wes out again just to like <laughs> say some shit. And then like and then what? I want to feed in the Labour spin lines at this point, as I feel it's only fair to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that uh the sort of the the three step strategy was to introduce Keir to the public mm. to expose Tory inadequacy and then the third and crucial part is to put forward a radical agenda for change in this country um, I suspect that the reason that's the third part might be because it's never going to come but <laughs> <laughs> any day now wait, waiting for the third part of the Labour strategy but, looking you know, for a third I yeah. think <laughs> <laughs> always, always looking for a third. Um, I think that's, I think that's kind of what they would say. I just, I, and I just want to say, I, mean, I quoted that he's going to say this: uh, the NHS trumps woke every day of the week. And I just want to talk about that a little bit before we move on to kind of the more counsel y side of things. And I kind of, I, I, I kind of agree with him on that. Right? Like, I think the second you say woke, even though it's a nonsense term and doesn't really mean anything, the second you describe something as socialist, the second you put like Jeremy Corbyn's name next to a policy, it essentially becomes toxic in the British electorate, largely because of the media apparatus that exists here. But I'm thinking of an interview I did with a sort of white, white van man who was saying, um, tax the energy companies. He was like, it is a joke. He, he actually said, it's a fugazi, is what he said to me. <laughs> he was like, tax them, tax them, tax them. How are they allowed to make this much money? And I said, oh, okay, that sounds like pretty socialist ideas you're talking about there. And he was like, no, fuck that, no, no, no. <laughs> socialist, no, 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 don't know about that. And the second you call something, people will su support funding the NHS, they'll support mm. higher taxes, they'll support windfall taxes. But the second you, I would never call something woke because it's largely a meaningless term at this point. But and if, when it did have meaning, I still wouldn't use it. But those, <laughs> those, there's support for the policies, but because of the media apparatus and the sort of the discourse around these issues, when you call them things like woke, when you call them things like socialist, people immediately turn off, even though if the policy is presented in isolation, they actually support it. Mm. But we saw that, didn't we, in the aftermath of the last election when Labour took a hammering, is that then you look at the individual policies and the, the polling for them, people were like, fuck yeah, mm, fuck yeah. yeah, we should like have free internet. As much as the BBC tried to like poo poo it. We're gonna nationalize sausages. Literally, oh. it's just, it's just like, <laughs> it's just like yes, so nationalize cool. Greggs, correct. <laughs> yeah, why not? Finally, and yeah. it's just like, yeah, well, you're right. Um, but it it sort of speaks to this. I just think the fact that, he's, that he has the gall to say the NHS trumps woke every day having spent the last like couple of years throwing everyone under the bus i mean i was specifically talking about trans people and the way that he has like ungracefully pivoted like me trying to fucking reverse an articulated lorry like away <laughs> from what was the most like milk toast but at least maybe kind of half not really but ish supporting to like yeah fuck them mm. like and and it's just like the reason that he's done that is because he's fucking where he stands for nothing but he's petrified he's absolutely petrified because he listens to like four people 
in some and like people don't give a shit people do not care about trans issues people are not in a way of like fuck them but it's just like this doesn't enter into people's day-to-day -day oh, lives yeah. like most people i think there's a huge part of the electorate that's like that that if you if you were to call them woke they'd be offended right but if you drill down into it and you say oh so do you think you know a, tra a trans person should be able to self-identify they'd be like well yeah of course they should yeah like well, it makes no difference yeah, to most, me most why would why would i care why would i care what that person does or you know I, any of the kind of race baiting not even dog whistle like you know suella but raverman literally being like they are invading this country mm -hmm. most people hear that and they go that's disgusting yeah they're like i don't i don't like that at all. Even like Jonathan Gullis reacted to it. And I, 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 he, he, he was like, "Oh, what the hell?" Like, I don't know. And, and he's he's more right wing than than your average person. So mm. I think most people are like, if it was specifically when it comes to trans people, like, oh, people people can do literally whatever they want. Mm. Like, will this affect my life in any way? No. Oh, okay. But you just you just need to look at it historically, right? Like. Nadia one Big Brother. What was it like twenty years ago? Yeah. yeah. As like an openly trans woman. Mm. Not like barely a blip. Hayley in Coronation Street was a trans oh, yeah. character for like the entire time when I was growing up. Not a fucking blip. It didn't make. Wasn't people just like getting themselves into like aneurysm territory, being like she's taking over women's spaces. It's just like it's a fucking cafe. <laughs> <laughs> she's making baps. Like she runs it with her loving husband. Literally, <laughs> this is yeah. a beautiful love story. <laughs> like, and this is the thing. It's just like you can ju you can see. It's like a really really great like demonstrate of the way in which these sort of like rabid freaks have utilized it and now uh, like you know introduce you know it's very much sort of confluencing with these like far right you look at the same people that are protesting outside of migrant hotels are the same people that are protesting outside of pubs in honor oak because mm -hmm. Drag queens are talking to children, or in the instance when we were there, literally not even talking. Like yeah, there, yeah. there was it, the event wasn't happening, mm -hmm. and that Lawrence Fox, Calvin Robinson, etc., still turned up. The pub, <laughs> the pub are kind of confused, being like, "Why are you fucking here? Like, <laughs> it's not happening. Please go away." <laughs> <laughs> You've caused like this like minor culture war to happen outside, and there's not even a drag event happening. Yeah, it's wild. Um, let, well, okay, so let's talk, let's move off culture wars then. Let's talk about pr let's talk about housing. Let's talk about the cost of living, and in the context of this. Uh, Labour win, right? Because I want to, I want to get it right. Uh, Keir's meeting with the leader of the 22 councils, they won, and they've been tasked with drawing up quote emergency cost of living plans within their first hundred days, as well as reviewing local housing and development policies. New research by which has revealed that two million households were unable to pay at least one bill last month. Sixty percent of people are cutting back on essentials or sold items to find the cash to keep up with their payments. That is real politics. There, that's mm. that's real issues and. I guess this kind of comes to the point earlier we were talking about whether how how much the local council in Plymouth can do to <laughs> help with the cost of living. However, um, it is a very pressing issue. Ed, how do you see how do you see housing tying into this? Where do you see, for example, something like council housing or house building on the behalf of local councils tying into that broader picture around, let's say, welfare, well being, you know, um, the cost of living? Mm. I suppose. Keir Starmer has the opportunity now. Now that these councils have, he's had some. This is, he's had some success here. He's these are local councils who, which have become Labour councils under his leadership. He has the opportunity now to prove well the three of us wrong. And yeah. if if he if the quality of life for people in these councils massively upturns thanks to being led by Labour, then we will all. I will eat Ben's hat and Ben will eat mine and we'll get Ollie a hat and he'll eat it too. But I was considering bringing down a baseball hat because I thought Ava's not here, it's guys being dudes. Dude rock. <laughs> just we'll, big bros. Yeah, we'll just spin our it's hats around. Dude and... rock pod. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Now we're in. Let's talk about housing. <laughs> um, yeah, we should talk about housing, right? Because I think, <laughs> I think it's one of the easiest wins. It's, okay, so solving the housing crisis is multifaceted, runs far deeper than just build more council houses, build more private houses. In, uh, there's a really good podcast by Michael Walker called Crash Course, which goes into this in detail, and we will not be able to do it justice in the same way, but a key component of, of it is council house building. I've got a stat here. In the 1950s, councils on average built 147,000 council houses a year. Mm -hmm. In the last 10 years, the average was 1,400 a year. Hmm. And then like 40% of those houses are now private rents because of right to buy, thanks to, you guessed it, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Um, you know, I. It's all very well and good. Keir comes in and says to the council, "You got to build houses." But I think it kind. They don't really have control over it. Like they need, they need to be allowed to borrow the money to build the houses. They need to be given grant funding, ideally by central government, in order to 
fund those things. I think also as well, talking about like money, should we invest in this? Should we invest in that? I th- I, I think we should look at housing not as a cost, right? So, it's, okay, we'll give you a grant of, let's say, I don't know, 10 billion quid to the local authorities in order to build houses. You will get that money back mm. in in health outcomes, mm. in general well-being, in, in uh, reduced levels of crime, in all of these things. I, I think you and I talk about this quite often on the desk about mental health. And how people just, uh, it's, oh, yeah, man, all these dudes are so unhappy. Like, we're all fucking yeah. miserable. And it's, oh, well, yeah, have you considered that, like, everyone's paying, like, 50% of their income on, like, a, rent, on, on, a yeah, rented, yeah. on a rented property? Like, they don't have housing security. Their lives aren't great. And it's like, why is everyone so upset? Yeah, it's not, it's not like, it's, it's well, when, I, when I first joined politics, we used to talk about, people, uh, this, this is kind of largely irrelevant as a cultural observation now. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Push through it. But um, people don't need Dr. Alex. Remember when Dr. Alex was, like, the mental health ambassador for the government mm. and I feel quite bad for him because he's like has quite a personal relationship with men's mental health because I think his, his brother died by suicide yeah. and so he I think he was really delighted to be in this position but he was set up to fail because mm. an ambassador for mental health to the government can achieve sweet fuck all mm. and what would actually really have helped men's mental health is literally like a better quality of life like being able to buy a home move out of your parents like not spend like the, you spend less money on mortgage and get to see your friends and go for a pint and then you can talk about your mental health like it's, not like, <laughs> it's, it's, such, it's such like it's such easy crutch bollocks and then, then also I suppose as well this is just a, a rant about the discussion of how we talk about mental health in this country but like imagine like the three of us now we've very good relationship if like we're like oh so how are you man like oh I'm, I'm currently experiencing a psychotic episode what, what are you two going to do? I mm-hmm. like, well, like, no, no one is equipped to actually deal with the genuine, horrific side of mental health. It's not just like, it's okay to not be okay, kind of up to a certain point if you're dealing with like anxiety or very mild depression. It's not okay to be currently engaged in psychosis and <laughs> not to be hospitalized. Mm. I think that's like, I think it's a really important yeah, distinction. I agree. And also, uh, this is a slightly weird anecdote that may or may not make the final edit, but I was, <laughs> uh, I was visiting my grandmother in her, in her care home this weekend. And I said, I walked in, I said to the receptionist, Oh, you're, you're okay. You're right. And she went, no, I've been better. I said, Oh, what's wrong? She's like, hay fever started. Terrible. <laughs> And I just, I, I just, you know what? When I asked you if you're okay, I didn't actually want you to tell me that. I, you're like, part of the problem. I'm, I'm sorry, you're part Sharon. Of the problem. I'm sorry, Sharon. I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. I've got hay fever as well. You must be grasses. I must be trees. <laughs> like, mine hasn't kicked in yet. I don't give a shit. Like, where's my grandma? I want to go see her. I want to go see her. Let me in. Hay Shut fever up. is not a mental health issue. <laughs> no, but I just, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is like when you... <clears throat> When you like the the whole "Are you okay, mate? Are you not okay?" It's just bullshit. It's like mm. no, no, no one seriously thinks like when I say to you, Ed, uh, when you come in, in the morning, uh, "How are you?" and you go, "Yeah, I'm okay." That I'm going to go, "No, no, how are you really?" You know, it's it, that's not when it happens. It's when you your meaningful relationships, proper support network, and you talk about these things. It's such a fucking cliche that. I think that men aren't able to talk about their feelings. It's just you don't have a relationship with a man strong enough where he feels confident to talk to you about it. So you think men don't talk about their feelings. I just don't think it's true. And also, I just think like there's nowhere to go. I think your, your point about psychosis is right. It's sort of like, you know, I've had mates who are like having a, a right mare and they sort of come to me and they'll ring me and I'll do the best I can. But I, I am not a practitioner. Mm. Right? I'm an idiot with a phone who can like who can be <laughs> like a good description of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> like, so got these like, jobs. Have you considered going to superstore? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean like I'll get a bag in. Do you know like, what you need? <laughs> MDMA. Yeah. Was, I've seen the studies, the microdosing apparently it works, <laughs> yeah, so let's like, just I'll just give you a tiny bit of ketamine and it'll uh, be fine. Can, 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 can you microdose this? I think would be I mean trying to microdose in the fucking is red it, light uh, of is superstore. Is it Kia microdose? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But like, yeah, I think you're right. And it, it speaks to this individualization yes. of yes. men's health. And it's like, yeah, it is correct that we should be having more conversations. And to a certain extent, like, when we met earlier, you were like, how are you? And I was like, ah, Bill. And it's like, oh, that shit. And like, you know, it would be nice to be able to be like, oh, how are you think? Oh, a little bit like, a little bit blue, a little bit sad, mm. etc. And like that, we should be talking more like that. And we should be engaging with each other more like that. But the problem comes is when it's like slightly more, you know, if I turned up and was like, actually, I've got TB. <laughs> You'd be like, okay, firstly, <laughs> could you stand over there? Uh. And secondly, have you considered going to the hospital? 
<laughs> Imagine you just walk, walking around with a broken arm and asking your friends to help. <laughs> and it's just like, that's the case, isn't it? It's just like what we don't... Like, and more and more people are walking around with like metaphorical broken arms or metaphorical TB because it's shit. This country sucks. It's a bad place to live. And there is nothing on the horizon like no offering from Keir Starmer, no amount of being like, well, what I'm going to do is I'm mm. going to sit down with That's the leaders impression. of 22 <laughs> councils and I'm going to tell them <laughs> that they should maybe build free homes. And I'm like, okay, fucking sick, mate. The but I went down, for example, last week to Eastbourne. We're doing a whole new like series of, um, about the cost of living crisis. And I went down to Eastbourne, went to a food bank there and talked to them about it and was like, what's going on? Because they happen to have like the highest per capita in the whole country of food parcels. And I was like, what, you know, what is it? Like, who are you, who are you seeing coming in? And we were talking about it and they were like, you know, what we are seeing more and more is particularly like, you know, single parents or, but more and more like across the entirety of the population are people in completely intractable positions. Like the idea of a food bank is to make sure people don't have to use a food bank, right? So mm. you come in, you, you're there for an emergency, you're a stopgap, and then you can pivot them over to this resource, this resource, this resource. They're not there. Mm. They don't exist. And that's like them literally maxing out the council. So if Keir Starmer wants councils to help, he needs to empower councils to do that by having our policy would be nice. You know what I mean? Like a something. Single delicious policy. Like yeah. Some kind of something that looks on a national level and recognizes. I mean, he's set, he's just set himself up to fail by talking, by bringing in, I mean, we were joking about it earlier, but, you know, by bringing in these national issues in a council, because part of the problem with the, the collapse of the Labour vote in 2019, part of the reason for that is because these communities have had Labour councils for so long and they have not seen any change. And part of that is because the council has been shit and complacent. They haven't been engaged in the community, but also because they have been Labour councils operating under an austerity Tory coalition and then government. Mm. And people don't understand, or like a lot of people don't understand like the delineation because at what point would you? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. most people have friends and like have sex and like, you know, drink. They're not like freaks like us. <laughs> <laughs> know about all of this shit and I still don't really yeah yeah, yeah. Sort of it. it's just like obviously so if Keir Starmer is being like don't worry vote for the council what we'll do is we'll sort out the hospital we're going to sort out inflation we're going to do this they can't fucking do it what mm. can do it is the National Labour Party yeah. a, a government having policies that's not oh my friends bills <laughs> Mate, give me a fucking break. <laughs> let's um, let's go for a little jaunt along the south coast from Eastbourne towards <laughs> Dorset um, to talk about the Bibby Barge, uh, or the hate boat as we were calling it earlier, um, where these migrants are going to be housed. Um, Ed, you've been to Dorset. You've, yes. You've, you've made a piece about the MP there, Richard Drax. Um, you'll be pleased to know he's found the time to talk about the Bibby Barge. Oh, good. The, 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 <laughs> the, the barge that's going to house the 222-bedroom mega barge, I should call it, uh, that will house asylum seekers arriving in the UK. Um, good to see he's found the time to talk about that um, because he's a very busy man, from what I understand. Mm, and he never talks about his entire, his, most of his well, <laughs> directly being descended from the slave trade. <laughs> but he's talking about this. Um, yeah, it's... I, th I, th I think the discussion around this is what's well, obviously it's a discussion in Britain about refugees and migrants, so it's going to be gross. But um, like the, the whole thing comes about because the Conservative government has decided that the hotels are too nice for these desperate people fleeing war zones. So they're like, well, we, we optically we can't be seen for them to be like enjoying a decent amount of human rights, so we need to p put them two in a room on a boat. Whatever it's it's just the whole thing's pretty gross, and then the objection to it, <laughs> the, the so it's, it's being put in Portland, which is a island just off of Weymouth in Dorset, which is like a holiday destination. It's like a sea, Weymouth is like a seaside town full of retirees, um, and just oh, there's local objections to it about people's safety, and I think about like I imagine a large racial element to it as well, <laughs> believe it or not. But um, <laughs> the, 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 mail, the Mail Online described it as a holiday hotspot being, like I think they said it was going to be ruined by this barge. Have they been to here. Weymouth? <laughs> the <greatest> of <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, it just, it just seems like, it just seems like, that's just gross. I, I, I actually don't really have much more to say than this whole, dis it's just a really depressing discussion. And once again, really vulnerable people are being 
made more miserable than your, they already are. Your point about this almost just being for the optics is really, really important because I, th- I think I said there, was it 222 bedrooms? I think it's so far six six or 7,000 people have crossed the channel this year. So this isn't, it's not practical. Do you know what I mean? It's not going to like, oh, yeah. this, this, well, how's everyone here? Yeah, it's one bite. It is literally just to be able to, for, for them to send like the GB News cameras down to and be like, look how fucking hanging this barge is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're going to make them all live here. So fucking cheers, yeah. boys. Um, <laughs> but, then, but then like, but then, like it, w- it won't be grim enough for them because no. at a gym in a games room mm. disgusting like, like prisons have that mm. so like so if, if, if so is the level like do you is it that conditions that are acceptable in prisons are too good for refugees and migrants is that is that the argument is that we're going to it's going to be a real gutter yeah race to the bottom depiction of how we treat uh, refugees and really vulnerable people well it's coming at a time as well isn't it where you we obviously have master in, in Kent, um, where you know, which is an ex-army base that was like cleared out because it was so fucking rotted, and then they were like, "Oh, don't mind, we just chuck him in there." And then obviously, people were getting diphtheria, people were um, getting seriously ill from the conditions in there. You know, they've just given themselves a load of new power to open up more. Ironically, they're doing one in an old prison, which also rotted, full of asbestos, cannot be used because of that. But don't worry, lads, we're going to put them in, in Bexhill, which if you've seen the film Children of Men, is where, <laughs> is literally where that camp in this like dystopic film yeah, yeah, yeah. is. And they're like, yeah, seems good. <laughs> like it wasn't a manual. But that's how Suella Bethlehem <laughs> watched it. It's like, fucking great oh, idea. Oh, you're so right. <laughs> yeah. ideas from this. Yeah, yeah and so it's just like, this is happening at the same time. You're right, like, it's entirely, it's not a solution. And they keep talking about solving small boats. Like, we will bring it, and it, they keep upping the ante because it was Rwanda, and then it was pushbacks, and then mm. it was this, and then it was that. You are not going to stop that. From the beginning of humanity, and then way back from when we were like, shit eating chimps or whatever was happening <laughs> I don't know I'm not fucking David Attenborough <laughs> like, all, we have moved we have moved across the surface of this planet and we will continue to do so in greater numbers because parts of this planet are becoming inhospitable and like unable to be lived on partly because of people like Drax's family who run coal mines coal and gas power stations which are polluting this earth more and more people will be moving because of things that we like get ourselves involved in we have no fucking business getting ourselves involved in bombing the shit out of the middle east Mm. like this is going to keep happening the way that you solve but i know i don't want none of us want people to get in a boat and cross the world's busiest shipping contain like shipping lane Mm. like no one wants that the way you solve that isn't by being fucking mental (laughs) it's by providing safe routes. Yep. Like that's the only solution here. And so like, we're just in, it is a race to the bottom, but it's sort of like, how is this gonna end? Because we, we people are dying in mm. the thing. I remember literally like four or five years ago, I wrote a piece, uh, there was some deaths in the med. And I wrote a piece being like, we will see bodies washing up on the shores of Britain before long. Mm. And I remember people being like, this is histrionic. This is like ridiculous. Like, isn't it? like It's fucking happening. Yeah. Like it's happening. And the more that they do this, it's all a show. It's all a farce. It is exactly that. But another thing I think to like, to talk about and to think about is the fact that like, when we did the stand selection, like, Part of the part of like what was quite amusing about it was that they tried to get us on terrorism. <laughs> Bless the luck, boys. <laughs> uh, better luck next time. <laughs> no flies on Ben's book. But that's part of that is because they had to shut down the runway because they said that we were like near it, which we weren't. We were in a very very remote part of the airport. The reason they did that is because they didn't want the fact that they were like literally putting people in shackles mm. who still had not had all of their. Um, all of their rights to appeal heard and just lobbing them in the middle of the night and then flying them off. Mm. And you know, there, there is a reason why detention centers are in butt fuck nowhere. There is a reason why they are choosing army bases. There is a reason why after we did that action, they then started doing deportations from military bases. Yeah. There is a reason why they're putting them on barges that are like through, I was talking to a friend in Falmouth, uh, which is where the barge currently is, where it's being spruced up. Um, and it's like, it's literally to get to it, you have to pass through a military zone. Mm. There's like, there a reason why people, the most, some of the most vulnerable people on this planet are being housed in these places. The UN reporter on, the, on violence against women in 2015 
was not allowed access to Yarlswood to report on the horrendous and endemic abuse within it by then Home Secretary Theresa May. That, even that's on land. People can see it. People can communicate. I've been there. We've like talked to them via banners and stuff. If you're on a fucking barge in a military zone, if you're on an army base, these bases are designed to keep people away. What is going on there? And who is going to have oversight? Because as we, you know, to bring it back to where we were at the beginning, the fucking cops aren't. They're going to be walking around like, like, we, who, what is going, like, where, where does this end? Not to like, you know, bring it down, but <laughs> why not? It's not good. <laughs> yeah, no, it isn't good. It's terrible. And um, I, we've gone full circle, so I think it's probably a pretty good place for us to draw a line under things. Ben Smoke uh, of Huck Magazine, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you acting as holiday cover for our dear, dearly departed Ava Santina. She will be back. She's um, not dead. She's not dead. She's, <laughs> she's, she's just on holiday. Um, Ed Campbell, uh, Politics Joe's politics producer, thank you so much for your witty uh, observations as always. Thank you. Please leave us a review, subscribe, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take it easy, guys.